the kiss, that's glorious, that's everyday women and men become legends, sins that go against our skin become blessings, the movement is a rhythm to us, freedom is like religion to us, justice is juxtaposition in us, justice for all just ain't specific enough, once I die, the spirit is revisiting us, true and living, living in us, resistance is us, that's why Rosa sat on the bus. That's why we walk through Ferguson with our hands up. When they go down, we woman and man up. They say stay down, and we stand up. Shots be on the ground, the camera panned up. King pointed to the mountaintop, and we ran up. One day, when the glory comes, it will be ours. skills develop. Any kid can read a textbook and be educated, but the human connection is something that can't be replicated. Websites and online tutors can have your child highly educated, but social skills in schools can't be emulated. So when there's no diversity and I'm surrounded by kids in the same circumstances, how can my thinking be challenged? I'm surrounded by an abundance of melanin. Do I have to go to college to see what it's like to interact with a peer who has white skin? It's like school has given me a key but put a latch on the door. My school wants me to dream to the moon, but lack the resources and has me lashed to the floor. I'm used to teachers leaving frequently, problems consistently, and they tell me it doesn't matter. Your lack of APs, SAT prep, college readiness, and school can't all be made up if you have persistency. Yeah, right. These paucity of resources leave my path to success derailed. How many poor black and brown students is this system going to fail? Let me ask you a question. Would you know how many students are in your school? Um, my school has 336 uh, children, and my school is seven schools in one campus building. So, um, how many guidance counselors do you have? We have one. One, and that guidance counselor is responsible for, to help you with college admission? Um, is actually, is actually also responsible for all interactions from 9th to 12th, so social, so oftentimes when I come for college support, there's been a fight between the freshmen, and he's like, I can't help you, these freshmen are having an issue. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Next, please.
Also, um, last Sunday, Linda Brown, the, the main figure in Brown vs. Board, passed away last Sunday. And you know, she was an amazing activist. She, for 75 years of her life, she fought for this. And um, this is really what the show is about. We want to fight for this, our education, for our students, our um, students of color, all these inequities that are going on. And to start off the show, we're going to start with 20 seconds of silence for Linda Brown. So, you know, bear Thank with you me so much as for we just um, reflect on her and her presence and everything that she did in this world. Regions 
pass all my classes, take SATs, and find activities to make up for the blanks in my resume. And I wondered, who was going to listen to me? Who was going to do something? I was drawn to a, a statistic which said about one in five black Hispanic students are deemed college ready after four years in high school. And when I heard this fact, I immediately thought about the kids in my school. I thought about the students who were not even ready for high school, who didn't come to class, who struggled with their work, but were too afraid to ask. Who was going to help them and cater to their needs so that they can be the best student? I don't know all of them personally or what their life at home was like, but I know in my heart we all deserve a quality education, but there's just not enough. Then it occurred to me that I am afraid. That statistic scares me because my school is predominantly black and Hispanic. Each and every single one of us have, has the potential to be great people in this world. In my school, we strive for college and beyond. And I always held that dear to my heart because that, because that men and girl like me from the South Bronx can be something other than a statistic. My school is not perfect, but, it's, but it is a community. And that alone is enough to get us through this. Yes, a lack, of, a lack of resources puts us at a disadvantage, but we regret to inform you that enough is enough. This moment right here, I am a team taking charge. And I am using my voice tonight not only for myself, but for all the students, for all the students at my school, all future guys. There I was, the salutatorian of my graduating eighth grade class, preparing myself for admission to my dream high school, Stuyvesant. Stuyvesant was that one school, that one school that was going to help support me and set a springboard for my future endeavors. My family wasn't well off financially. Oftentimes, we struggled, and there was constant worry over whether we had food in the fridge or we had school supplies. I wasn't expecting to enroll in an SHSAT course like Kaplan or the Princeton Review, like my fellow affluent classmates. Nevertheless, I persisted. I sought out a free course slash program that's funded by the DOE called DREAM. Upon hearing the name of the program, I knew this was my chance to really meet my goal. I was one step closer to Stuyvesant. Every Saturday morning, I would take a two-hour train ride trip to the site where the program was held. My excitement and eagerness faded upon finding out that my course was set in a dilapidated building and my so-called instructor wasn't there for the purpose of instructing, but rather for the paycheck. I was only one of six students that showed up. We were given a workbook and told to start on page two. I distinctly remember inquiring my instructor about a problem in the workbook, and as a response, my book was thrown back at me and I was told to figure it out myself. So there I was, figuring it out myself. October rolls in. I show up to the test with two crisp, sharpened number two pencils and almost little to no knowledge or practice for the, for the test thanks to my so-called course at Dream. November, December, January, February, March. Results day. I opened my letter to find out that my score amounted to nothing in comparison to my classmates. As classmates shouted that they've been accepted to Staten Island Tech or Bronx Science, my letter revealed that I was matched to my zoned high school. There I was, the salutatorian, matched to the zone program because I was poor. The specialized high school exam tests material that would not have been known to your average eighth grader unless a prep course was taken. Yes, the specialized high school test is race blind. Yes, the specialized high school test is bias blind, but we cannot forget that only less than 5% of black and Latino students make up these schools. The dichotomy speaks for itself. Something must be wrong. We cannot forget that this barricades financially disadvantaged students' opportunity to attend an elite high school. Claiming that the test is non-biased is an absolutely vapid justification for keeping it in place. Claiming it subjugates thousands of overly qualified students simply because of their lack of resources and for reasons beyond their control. One test is not and should not be the determining factor of one's success. My story is only one of countless others that fell into the traps of the wretched mess that we call an education system.
When I applied to high school, I navigated through the process nervously but with a clear plan. I knew the steps to take, the good schools to apply to. These were the schools I put first and second on my list. I knew how to speak thoughtfully about myself for my Beacon interview, how to unscramble a paragraph for the SHSAT, and I knew how to pirouette for my LaGuardia audition. In a nutshell, I was prepared. I felt the stress of the process, but the stress I experienced was, well, relatively small. I was energized and excited. I envisioned myself in schools with small classes, art supplies, and engaged teachers. And this was all because I was given the tools that allowed me to see myself excelling in rigorous environments. I also remember being conscious of how many students in my middle school were applying to the school I go to now, Beacon High School, a well-resourced school that's more competitive than Harvard. I did not think of the minuscule acceptance rate. Instead, I thought I had pretty good odds, and I did. I had good odds because I am privileged in an, I'm a privileged student in an unequal school system. I come from a neighborhood that is also mainly white and wealthy, and through this, I've benefited from public schools that have more resources, better teachers, and have helped me to grow as a person. These are the facts of the system, the New York City public high school system, the largest and most segregated in the country. My experience is the norm for students who come from similar racial and socioeconomic backgrounds, and this is not because I am smarter or more deserving. We regret to inform you that the system is broken and unequal, and it cannot go on like this anymore. Students, all students, not just those of privilege, have a right to an education of equal quality. We have a right to learn beside and from students of differing backgrounds. This is no radical statement, yet simply an extension of how a public school system is supposed to function. Have we forgotten? Yet, in 2018, 64 years after the Brown v. Board of Education decision, we continue to fight for our rights. So today, we will make history. We are the students, and we are angry, and we are tired, and we are going to fight for ourselves and each other, and for all the students before and after us. And no one can stop us. Hi, guys. Oh, um, OK. Um, so us four made a petition um, about integrating New York City public schools, and so we're gonna give you some information about it. Despite the fact that New York City is hugely diverse, the city has one of the most segregated school systems in the nation, which we want to change. In school, we learned about the civil rights movement. We learned about separate and equal, and how it was actually not equal. We learned about the injustice of segregated school systems. And however, we were learning this in a really segregated school system, and that is really not okay. And we, we made this petition because we thought that we definitely needed to change this. Um, so we decided to do this, and we got really inspired by Teens Take Charge and how they got their voices heard. And we wanted to do that, and, this, and we made the petition. Um, so we also wanted to say that schools should look like our city. Our city is hugely diverse, yet our schools are not. Um, we also would like to give a lot of credit to Teens Take Charge, who we were really inspired by. And thank you, guys.
recall that. Anyway, this side has better resources. What do you mean? This side has a window. That side has an old radiator that's probably radioactive by now. This side has a desk, a laptop. That, that's my laptop. I gave you my username and I gave you my password. I don't recall that. Well, <laughs> I have the receipt. Can I see that? Mm -hmm. To whom it may concern, there once was a girl who dreamed of the perfect high school. She took the test like everybody else and was very unprepared. And while the other kids took the test, mm, can I start again, please? Okay. Oh yeah. 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 Thank you. To whom it may concern, there once was a girl who dreamed of the perfect high school. She took the test with very little preparation while the other kids in her classroom finished in half the time she did. It wasn't until a few years later that she realized that they had the extra money, the extra tutoring, the extra set of hands to help them through the process while she just worked with the two hands she was giving. Take note of my emphasis on extra. She was lost, confused, and unknowing. A few weeks later, she found out that she had failed. That's it, I'm not smart enough, she said to herself repeatedly as she wondered about the high school she would be placed into. It's, if only she knew at the time that it wasn't about smartness. The system is rigged. Um, soon she heard that no one from her, high from her middle school had gotten in. A middle school located in, located in the South Bronx, 80% Hispanic, 15% black, 5% other. And not a single one stepped foot in specialized high school grounds. She carried home a thick book, High Schools Upon High Schools Upon Hopelessness. She was fascinated by the colors of the book, but was even more confused by it. The idea of, of choosing a high school was more exciting than the real thing. The illusion of freedom, the illusion of freedom of choice is a real thing that no one should ever be subject to. You're probably asking why you should be concerned about this little eighth grade girl. Sadly enough, that confused little eighth grade girl was me. I'm not gonna ask how many of you fell victim to the system because one hand raised is already too many. One undereducated child is already too many and one rigged education system should not have existed in the first place. I regret to inform you, to those who don't want to see new and improved system, that we will see change. It may not be today, it may not be tomorrow, but I promise you that, we will, that day will come. Come the first day, I will walk in and be reminded, reminded that I am a number. Not a number, but more so a glitch. A glitch in their system of bias and privilege. Two words that my, classroom, that my classmates can't define. At the Acceptance Students Day, I was met with the reality of what it's like to attend an Ivy League institution as a Latino immigrant from the South Bronx. Having attended public school where most of the students look like me, I have heard many interesting phrases, and no, I do not mean dead ass beat. <laughs> what I thought were the cool kids of color were actually whitewashed rich kids who claim to love the New York City I am not a part of. As we discussed how lit and memorable the next four years would be, our girl next to me said, I can't wait to be hood adjacent with you guys. I lived across the street from the projects for a year, so I have some experience. And you know what I did? I laughed. I laughed as if I was not actually from the hood and had half my family in it. I laughed as if I, 
as if she's not the reason why there's a Starbucks on my block. I laugh as if the comments like this are not the one, are not the one reason why kids like me become labeled the angry black man on campus. I laughed as if every bone in my body was not on the verge of giving him some sensitivity training. And then I thought to myself, that's what happens when you grow up around the same people the whole time. There's no discord when everyone has a golden spoon in his mouth. In hindsight, I initially wrote this uh, under the impression that I wanted to criticize the system. But now, thinking about it, I'm anxious, apprehensive about being victimized by a system that takes pride in making my success possible. When in fact, I've had, to, I've had to make up for my disparities by spending over 700 hours at an academic program. Yeah, I made it, now what? Come the first day of classes, I will be a speck in UPenn's demographics. Come the first day of classes, I will be the black guy in the yellow t-shirt. Come the first day, I will walk into a dining hall and be met with stairs and feel like tattooing my GPA on my forehead. Of course, I'd be a Penn student, but would I receive the validation? Will I have people ask me if I'm on a scholarship? Will they want to touch my hair? Will I even be Wyatt Perez? They run as if they were playing tag, pushing against each other, competing to see who's early enough, to who's fast enough. But no, they're not stepping on a track. They are race, their feet are on classroom floors, and they are racing for calculators, specifically Texas Instrument TI-84. <laughs> You're lucky if you don't have to share them. Lucky in the first place, if you have one. Or else you're stuck with the old ones. The ones that become the reason you aren't part of the class. The ones you don't only do algebra with. But you're in a calculus class. A class where having a TI-84 makes your life much easier. <laughs> a class you feel privileged to be in. Privilege because the Atlantic states have classrooms with a majority of students who look like me or rarely offered classes like chem, physics, and algebra too. You cannot ask me to remain sane. Not when the promised tech calculus textbooks aren't even are at our tables. And it's already March, technically April, but who am I kidding? Are they even coming? You cannot ask me to remain sane. You cannot ask me to stay seated. You cannot ask me to stay silent. Not when my education is barely the half as the students who don't look like me, whose pockets are full, whose resources are endless, whose futures are a given, whose parents' legacy is a promised seat at Harvard. I was a book thief <laughs> when I slept on cardboard, when I was ashamed to ask my parents for a dollar, when all my clothes were hand-me-downs, when my sneakers weren't Nikes, and my classmates' famous taglines was out of their lips, what are those? <laughs> Yet even as a book thief, this system steals my education more than I steal mine. You pride yourselves in doing so, in splitting the line, calling some gifted, perhaps even specialized, as if God and, and as if God said Hispanics, Latinos, and Blacks are to be in underserved public schools, and Caucasians and Asians were to be filling the halls of specialized early colleges and privates. You pride yourselves in making an equal system, a system that's supposed to be more diverse, but everyone has the same opportunity to take that test. Of course everyone does. The test is just a Jim Crow laws for the blacks new right to vote. You pride yourself in being the most diverse city in the world. 
yet your public school system is more segregated than in the South. You pride yourself in that your history doesn't include massacres and deaths of innocent children and people. You pride yourself in owning the name of New York and not Alabama or Mississippi. But why pride yourself in all that? We ain't talking about history. We are living the present. And before you know it, New York is in a textbook in the chapter on school segregation. A textbook a black student wouldn't touch. And perhaps we may not have photos stating whites only, but when you call school screened, we have to question who exactly you're trying to screen out. If you don't start doing something about the segregated system, you'll wind up on the wrong side of history. But I am not so terrified about that. <laughs> because here we are, the minority against the public school system. We regret to inform you that we are the majority. <laughs> and we aren't going anywhere. Hi everyone, the name is Amadou, your average Amadou. So this morning, I came into the office of my counselor. I was talking to him about scholarship and how to pay for college. And then the assistant principal walked in. And she was, Amadou, congratulations, you got into NYU. Thank you. But for some reason, I, was, I wasn't filled with pride. Instead, I was regret. Because I got in because of the HOP program. And then she continued talking. She's, in the seven years that I have been here, you are the first one that we got to get into NYU. Yeah. Then I was wondering, I wonder why that is. That takes me on back two years ago. When I first arrived to the United States, I went to Fordham to look for a school with my brother. And they looked at me. They didn't ask me to take a test. They didn't ask me what grade we were in when we were in Africa, West Africa, Guinea. <laughs> but they knew exactly where I belonged, into an international school. They didn't even ask me if I spoke English. I mean, I'm not saying I spoke English at the time, but they didn't ask me. They didn't care to know. <laughs> but I went in anyway. I got into the school. I was expecting, OK, at least maybe they're going to put me into 10th grade. But no, 9th grade. Why? Because why do I have to be in 9th grade? I mean, I was already in 11th grade when I was in Guinea. Why do I have to be in 9th grade? Because. Why? Because. OK. <laughs> I sat in. I went from 9th grade, 10th grade, 11th grade. I finished all my pre bar requirement, my graduation requirement, requirement in 11th grade. I got into 12th grade this year. And then I was like, now what? <laughs> what am I supposed to do now? Can I take APs? No. Uh, what college preparation courses do you have? Uh, you have one goal for kids that are failing. I mean, I'm not failing. I already finished with all my. But that is there. OK, I'll take it. So that, that's how it went. That's why today, in the morning, 
when my teacher asked me if I would come here and represent our school, I didn't think twice. I knew I wasn't prepared to come here and talk. I didn't write anything. Barely, I got here when I was standing here. That's where I wrote whatever I think I was going to speak here. I thought that my, sto my story was going to be enough. But then I remembered, this is not my story. This is her story. And her story too. And her story too. We came here, they didn't ask us, where do you want to go? What college do you want to go to? What class do you want to take? But they knew exactly where we was, where we were supposed to be. And we didn't want to be there. None of us chose to be there. So I'm thinking right now, what do I regret to inform you? I regret to inform you that, give me a minute. We were expecting better. Thank you. I have gone to three types of schools internationally. Private school, public school, and charter school. Private school was in Cameroon, filled with six hour school days. I was enrolled when I was two, so that's when I learned to read and write. By the time I was four, I could already write neatly, and I knew my 12 times tables. I learned long division in the first grade, and by the second grade, we were given tests with intricate, intricate arithmetic word problems. The six years I spent in that school were still some of the best in, in my school career. It was the only school that I've ever been to that knew how to balance discipline, education, and kids still being kids. There was an hour built in for recess every day, and our teachers would oftentimes take us to the schoolyard for lessons. When I immigrated to the United States in America in 2008, at the closing of the presidential election, I crashed into the New York City public school system. And boy, was it a crash. I didn't speak English could barely read, and could write a few words, but surely not at a third grade level. I was eight. My speech and sense of hearing rendered useless in a land where teachers spoke at the speed of light. The only glimpses of belonging and understanding for a kid like me, who had always fa fared better, better with numbers, were for 75 minutes a day when Miss Fiorino had us open our little orange math workbooks with the zebras on them. McGraw Hill was my Neverland. Because there weren't any French translators at PS 105, I was excused from taking the ELA state test. But that was only for that year. The next year, I was thrown into the lion's den. I did fine on the reading section, but the listening kicked my ass. Because to me, even with an IEP, my, stitch, my teacher still read with the urgency of someone trying to escape a burning building. My writing skills were mediocre because there wasn't anyone equipped to aid me in transitioning from French to English. My high school and middle school years were filled with 10 to 12 hour school days with three to, with three to five hours allotted for reading, writing, and math. My teachers were training us, <clears throat> my teachers were training us to play catch up in a race with people who started the relay off with private tutors in first grade and tackled the last leg with specialized high schools. Honing math skills proved more successful than teaching kids to comprehend 19th century language, words like heretofore and flumadiddle. <laughs> By the time I got around to test prep, I realized three fundamental truths at the exact same time. Our futures, which depended on a set of two numbers, one out of 36 and another out of 1,600, were doomed unless we found a way to cram years worth of experience and familiarity with these exams into seven short months. We were further behind in this race than we were led to believe because despite the amount of time and energy we had put in in the last three to six years, our miseducation beforehand left us severely handicapped. And three, catch up 
doesn't compare to continual, constant, and steady preparation. And it's not fair to compete when you don't compare. The preparation in my first six years of academia allowed me to finish my math section of the SAT because I was able to save precious, precious time by foregoing the use of a calculator for most questions. I had masters skimming and multiple choice because it was the skills the tutors that I had through second grade had ingrained in me. Even with a different language and application, the application of the, still was, of the skill was still the same. I was fortunate. Most black and brown students in the New York City public school system, especially immigrant children, are not because they've inherited a cyclical curse brought, through, brought on by school segregation, characterized by inefficient and deficient resources. As a person whose native hand wasn't attuned to the rules of, on English, I still struggle to feel my writing is on par. I have yet to finish a timed essay. I seem to never have the right words, so as the second hand on the clock moves, second guesses fill my head at a rate that blocks my ability to write my first thoughts. I have been robbed. No amount of intelligence or catch up will catch me up in that. And so I regret to inform you, black and brown immigrant children have been robbed by the system. The other day, I was cleaning around the house with my mom. Hi, mom. Okay. Um, and I found a crumpled win for life scratch off lottery ticket. Um, I straightened it out, you know, looking through the numbers, hoping that my grandmother, who I assume had previously um, scratched it, I, I hope that she had mistakenly disregarded the numbers, you know. One million dollar guaranteed payout on the front in bold. That's a lot of money, you know. <laughs> when I was younger, um, one million seemed enough to buy the whole world. Um, but now, if I won one million, I wouldn't think twice about quitting my job because that's barely enough to cover the many expenses of a New York City resident, let alone an upcoming college student. And combine that both, in, yeah. So, um, you know, I hope that I would win. I didn't, of course, and this was just one of those moments where you just sit and you look at a simple statement, a simple piece of paper, and you automatically become Aristotle, you know, deciphering those abstract thoughts that just seem to be spilling out into the open. So, you know, we put our all into this system. You know, we work hard, we pay our taxes, we follow the law, and hope that our efforts are enough to guarantee our students the best education possible. People are drawn to lotteries because they know, even, with, even though their chances are slim, the odds are pretty much fair. No one has an upper hand, really. And this is not how the high school admissions process works. It's like some people have paid off the guy who pulls the ping pong balls with the numbers. The admissions playing field is far from level. Many continuously strive, hoping that their children will get the best quality education possible, only to find out that their location and socioeconomic status deprives their children of that right. And that contrary to their more affluent peers, many of them will slip and fall through the cracks of this system and become part of the seemingly never-ending cycle of poverty. Win for life. Three simple words. There are so many students in college and those who are headed there who could only wish to have had access to an education that would allow for them to compete on a level playing field with their peers, only to find out that their scores amount to nothing. I look upon a sea of faces, some expressions knowing, some unknowing. But if I can choose one thing, one simplistically complex thing, that affects all of us, it is the various inequities that plague this nation, that plague this world. One of the biggest issues we face in New York City, one of the most diverse cities in the nation, in the world, is educational inequity and school segregation. As my team and our allies seek to combat these issues, we face opposition from time to time. Many question our efforts, claiming that they are futile, that our time would be better spent addressing other smaller problems or problems that kids are supposed to address. There's also the idea that school segregation is too big of an issue for us to tackle. There are a lot of other issues in the world, yes. And many claim that fighting for a quality education can wait because there are more pressing matters to tend to. I say no. How can we expect our generation to advance and become future competent leaders 
If we do not provide a quality education to each and every student in this city, in this nation, how can we be expected to come up with a solution to the many issues that we face in this world if we are only giving certain kids the tools to do so? There are tens of thousands of kids in the city who go without textbooks, quality school meals, students who don't get access to AP courses because they were placed into small failing high schools that only offer a fraction of the academic opportunities at large affluent schools. Win for life. It's like we have two high school systems and there are students out there who are joining gangs and participating in illegal activities because their schools don't have enough money to fund their after school programs. In my old middle school, I saw many of my peers being absorbed into the local neighborhood gangs, finding mentors and role models in the leaders of these groups as opposed to their teachers. So what's the problem? I regret to inform you all that the changes we seek cannot be executed by my team and I alone. Because we seek to improve upon the conditions in our school, in our society. We mustn't forget that most leaders throughout history relied not only on themselves, but on the collective actions of their allies in order to advance their agendas and achieve their goals. We, the youth, are becoming increasingly disenchanted by this system, a system that does not benefit us. We, the youth, in order to form a coalition of allies and diverse thinkers, do establish restorative justice, ensure educational equity across all borders, provide for the common defense of our right to attend diverse schools, promote the general wellness of resources, and secure the blessings of liberated curricula that acknowledge our beautiful histories and identities. In this we do ordain, and by the power vested in us do we establish our own constitutional body. We are out here now, not 100 years ago, not 25, not 50, now. I look upon a sea of faces, some expressions knowing, some unknowing. But if I can choose one thing, one simplistically complex thing that affects all of us, it is the various inequities that plague this nation, that plague this world. Win for life. Will you stand on the sidelines, or will you help us to transform our school system into one that will support future leaders, students, change makers, and revolutionaries? I will no longer ask you, what's the problem? No. But now I will ask you, what can we do about it? Thank you. These students have put their all into their pieces. Like, that was just phenomenal. I was getting goosebumps. Like, they did an incredible job. Um, yeah, like, that was just very amazing. Um, but right now, we're going to transition from students' performances. You know, we had our middle school students over there who did a phenomenal job to our high schoolers. But right now, we're going to have a policy presentation based off the high school admissions process. And it's just like a learning info so that you could know more about the issues and the inequities that exist. And we have our wonderful Coco and Wyatt who are going to lead us in that. So thank you, guys. Hi. I'm back up here again. Very happy to be here. Um, my name is Coco Ram. I'm Wyatt Perez. Good evening, everyone. Um, and so what we're going to present to you all now is our enrollment equity proposal. So as you can see, the New York City public school segregation, in a median school and a representative school, the differences are very obvious. You have more representation in the, in the representative school than in the median school. And the median school like, kind of exemplifies what's the system throughout, like, for the most part. So um, the DOE has addressed racial and socioeconomic segregation, but what we wanted to bring into the conversation was academic segregation. And what's really important to understand with this is that these three forces are all interconnected. So there are dozens of screen schools in New York City which have the best performing students. And when I was applying to high school, I had no idea what a screen school was. Neither did anybody in my family. Um, and for me, I go to a screen school, so it was definitely something that was on my mind. It was, you know, interviews and writing and auditions. And so, out of the many schools in the New York City public school system, we want to focus on two schools. School A, which is a screen school, and School B, which is a, not a screen school. 
Uh, school A, as you can see, has a huge presence of white and Asian students and a decent presence of black and Hispanic students and others. What we like to point out is that the free reduced lunch population is 24%. And that speaks more so to the economic aspect of the school itself. So you have 24% of students who need like ec economic resources. And that's compared to 75% around that um, for the whole city. And then you have school B. So school B is overwhelmingly black and Hispanic with really small populations of white, Asian, and other students. And 84% of the students in school B qualify for free or reduced lunch. So we looked at the ELA proficiency, which is English language arts, of freshman cohorts at each high school from their eighth grade state exam. And citywide, it was 40% proficient, but that doesn't really match up with the demographics at every school. So here we are again with school A and school B. School A, again, we looked at the racial and economic um, statistics for school A, but what we also see is that academics really play into this. 91% of the incoming freshmen at school A had e were ELA proficient. And in school B, again, we looked at these statistics um, surrounding race and economics, but what you also see is that only 6% of the incoming freshmen were proficient. So as, can you go back? so as you can see, there seems to be some correlation between uh, academic performance, economic background, and race. And you wanna tell them a little something? I go to school A. And I go to school B. So the racial composition of high schools by incoming ELA proficiency range can be seen on this graph. As you can see, school B, which is on the zero to 20% side of the spectrum, has a high population of black and Hispanic students and low white and Asian. And as you move upwards on ELA proficiency, you can see that the racial demographics shift. You can see an increase in white and Asian students and a decrease in black and Hispanic students with ELA proficiency. So that last slide, a lot, lot of numbers going on there. So we're just gonna zoom in to the 155 schools that fall into the zero to 20% range of incoming ELA proficiency. And what you can see is of, these, of all the students in these schools, the students are overwhelmingly black and Hispanic and very, um, the population of white and Asian students in these schools is very, very low. Now, 148 high schools have college readiness rates between zero and 20%, and 144, and 144 of these schools have a proficiency rate of zero to 20% in math, ELA, or both. So renewal schools, you may have heard this term thrown around, um, but in the Bloomberg administration, schools that were underperforming tended to be shut down, but um, when de Blasio came into power, this, there's kind of been a shift in the way we approach these schools. And so what you can see here with this quotation is that um, schools that are underperforming have been transformed into renewal schools. And the aim is to help these schools by pouring resources into them to help them um, kind of improve, have better results. Um, and so let's see how it's actually been going. So. The administration has spent 582 million on these renewal schools. And now we're gonna see what that's covering and what it's actually doing. So um, this $582 million, a ton of money, has been <laughs> going into um, kind of these 10 different interventions. So you can see them for yourself, but a few include community partnerships, longer school days, guidance counselors, and none of them address enrollment. But wait, Coco, shouldn't schools already have parent engagement and guidance counselors? They should. <laughs> they don't, though. That's bad. <laughs> so the incoming proficiency at 31 of these renewal high schools is, as you can see, relatively low. You have 0 to 20% for math and ELA, and only some schools have only math proficiency between 0 to 20%. So clearly, the resources that are being put into these renewal schools are not making the change that needs to happen. The results, not so great. So um, what you can see here is the rate of change in these schools has been really slow. And um, although these are you know, well-intentioned efforts, um, what's been happening hasn't really been changing the way things in these schools are going on. So what can we do? We can have some simple enrollment regulations. So increase academic diversity, it can reduce racial and economic segregation and improve outcomes at low-performing high schools. At the cost of what, Zip Coco? Zero dollars, yay! <laughs> um, so 
in order to kind of address these inequities that we've been speaking about, we have a few proposals. So our first proposal here is to set cutoffs for minimum academic diversity of incoming freshman classes. So the idea behind this is that the 62 schools in the 0 to 10 percent would have to be raised to be above this 10 percent rate. And then, oh, and this is again addressing the um, incoming proficiency rates in terms of ELA. And the 14 schools, not including specialized high schools, that are in the 80 to 100 percent range of incoming ELA proficiency would be moved below this. Um, and so that would be kind of a way to achieve academic diversity. And through increasing academic diversity in these schools, we'd also be working to integrate these schools racially and in terms of socioeconomics. So our goal is to see incremental change every year. So every year we want to push the limits closer to the goal, which is 80% of students. So if one year it's 10% of ELA proficiency, the next year we want 12%, 15%, and so on and so forth. And then you see the same thing happen on the other side of the spectrum. The schools that already have the majority of high-performing kids want to move that down a bit to, let's say, from 90% to 85% to 82%. Proposal two. So this one is actually really simple. The idea behind propose, our second proposal is just to give students more information. Um, so a few of our students giving testimonies have spoken about how daunting and confusing the process is when you're applying to high school. And um, you know, one of the things that you're given is the high school directory. Um, but there's a lot of information missing from these directories. And so what we want to do is inform students about a school's SAT scores, proficiency rates, and college readiness rates. Um, and when I speak about college readiness, that is kind of a bar that's been set by CUNY for New York, I believe. And um, it is a numerical judgment. Um, and so this is kind of the page for why it's high school. Yeah, so when I was applying to high school, I, well, I was already there for middle school, but I didn't really have the information that I now know, so I didn't see SAT scores, I didn't see college readiness. I saw 79% of students graduate in four years, I'm like, that's pretty good, like, that's a good thing. But now, like, had I known this information, I think I would have made, like, different choices and have taken other things into consideration as well when I was applying. Now my favorite topic, <laughs> specialized high schools. So, specialized high schools make up about 6% of the New York City public school system. 18,000 students. Yet, 81% of students are white or Asian, and 13% of students are black or Hispanic. The other, non-reported. So, how do we kind of fix this really extreme segregation that is happening in the specialized high schools? We replace the SHSAT with proportional allotment. Um, and so, before I explain what this looks like, just want to give credit to Lazar Trishan for all of this research and this um, proposal specifically. Um, so what is this, you know, why does this work? Um, the theory behind this is that if you take the top 3% of every middle school's graduating eighth grade, graduating class, and you offer those students seats in specialized high schools, these high schools will be a lot more racially and socioeconomically diverse. Um, and this is because we know middle schools are also segregated. Um, and so students that are in these middle schools but don't have resources to help them prepare for the SHSAT, even though they might be you know, extremely intelligent and have lots of talent and potential and everything, are still not being admitted into, the spe into these specialized high schools. So we know that these students are high achieving. And so in order to help them get into the specialized high schools where they belong, you take the top 3% of the graduating class and you offer them seats. And this will definitely help to make these schools a lot more diverse. Well, that'll be it. Um, add your name at teenstickcharge.com equity. Thank you. Uh, we are always blown away to actually see it come to fruition. Can we give it up one more time for every student who's been up here tonight? My name is Taylor McGraw. I'm Adrian Uribarri. We're co-founders of The Bell, an organization that amplifies the voices of students in education and empowers them to lead the fight for their futures. So along with our podcast, any podcast subscribers in the room? Okay, all right, all right. Um, 
which you'll hear about in a second. We've got an exciting update. Uh, we have the honor of facilitating Teens Take Charge and working with these phenomenal young people. Um, and I just want to say that this is our third event in 11 months. Anybody been to one of our events before in the room? OK, all right. And each of those three events has been at a public library branch. Now, we know what a public library is. You don't have to prove your merit on a multiple choice test to get a library card. We have some incredible public parks in the city. They're open to everyone, equally enjoyed. Many of you took public transit here tonight. You may not have enjoyed it, but <laughs> at least when we're delayed, we're all delayed together. <laughs> public schools, though, are a different story. And some people tell us the system is too big, these problems are too entrenched, we can't integrate this school system. 400 years of American history, the mayor says, can't do it, wish I could. What we hope tonight is that the message from the students has been loud and clear. As we have seen here and at other recent events across the country, when we listen to students, they teach us more than we can teach them. That was the belief behind the bell when we began talking about it two and a half years ago. We looked around and heard adults shouting at each other about education, expecting students to keep their voices to a whisper. No more. <laughs> what you are witnessing tonight are the fruits of our first podcast season, Hearts and Minds. Armed with little audio equipment and a lot of passion, Taylor over here went across the city to record the stories of students. And as they told their stories, some of these students decided to do more. They started Teens Take Charge. Today, we're excited to announce the next phase of this virtuous cycle the second season of our podcast titled Miseducation. We'll share a preview in a moment, but before we do, we want to share a few ways you can support this work. First, you can go to teenstakecharge.com on your public Wi-Fi in here tonight. Uh, and you can click on uh, support us. You could also go to teenstakecharge.com slash donate. Uh, even $10 helps us buy snacks for our meetings. Can we get a shout out for the snacks? You guys, you like the snacks? And every little bit helps us support these student leaders. Yeah. Second, you can volunteer your time. We need more adults who are willing to step up and show our support is not just lip service. And finally, follow us on social media. We have more people in this room than followers on some of our social media accounts. So we need to change that tonight. Um, we're at Teens Take Charge NYC on Instagram and Facebook. And uh, our Twitter account for the bell is at Bell Voices. Uh, please follow. Um, I know the, the cell service is, is not so great, but again, public Wi-Fi. Thank you again for coming. We present a preview of our second season, Miseducation. <laughs> Graduation rate in upwards of the high 90s. And you have other communities such as the Carl, where the graduation rate was black. 
fourth of his round four fighters. Eight hours a day, five days a week. We know this is still better than anyone. Starting when I was four years old, I was just separated from anyone who looked different than me. I was imagining that I'd be treated like Ruby Bridges. I opened up my letter to reveal that my score had to do nothing. School was very chaotic, we couldn't really control it, so schooling for me was really hard. It literally came in between me and my friend's head. We realized it was a bullet. Half the class got on the floor and crawled out. And the day after, we were placed into the same room. We were studying for the finals, and my teacher completely skipped over Africa and South America. When I asked why we didn't do it, he said, what did they actually contribute to society? Listening to students forces us to confront the realities in our schools. From the admissions process, the course offerings, mental health counseling, the sports access. We're tackling the inequities in this system head on. How do we become the fairest big city in America? By listening to the voices of the people. I'm Taylor McGraw. I'm Sabrina Oliver. My name is Zoe. Yaz. Terrence. Maya. Heba. Naima. And we're the team that's bringing you this education. We'll be back soon. In the meantime, this is MissEducationPod.com for more info. And follow us on our Twitter and Facebook at MissEducationPod. Every child should have the best. And every child should have the same because that is just an extension of what it means to be a public school system. how Teens Take Charge got started. Um, me and Whitney were featured on the, the podcast, Miss Education. Um, yeah, and that's why we're here talking about education and equity. So give it up to Adrian and Taylor one more time, please. <laughs> so right now, we're going to be transitioning to a panel discussion between adults who are well-versed in education and students who are from, from our team. Um, so can I welcome up April Chapman, um, Brad Lander, and Lazar Treshkin. I apologize, thank you. And um, the students, please come up here. So Coco, Xaviera, Dio, and Sega. Thank you guys. All right, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. One more time, my name is Sagar Sharma. I'm not sure if you guys have seen me before, but thank you all for being here. Thank you to every single person that's sitting on this panel, the adult leaders along with the student leaders. We know that student voices or adult voices alone do not make enough change in New York City, so the only way that we can make a change is together. Not just us, but every single person in this room has an effect and has that change that we would like to see in New York City. Now, what I would like to do is start it off with intro so that every single body in this room knows who's speaking and knows where we're coming from. So please, start us off. Thank you. Good evening. Wow. It's a, an honor to be here. I just want to give it up one more time for the young people and those incredible performances in that. Um, It's like we're asking young people to take responsibility for solving some problems we've created in a pretty big way. And um, this suggests at least that you guys are totally capable of it. So it's an honor to be here. My name is Brad Lander. I'm a member of the New York City Council. I represent some neighborhoods in Brooklyn not too far from here. Um, I had the honor to be with you guys at the Schomburg for an uh, earlier Teens Take Charge event, which was great. Um, and along with Richie Torres, I'm a co-sponsor of the School Diversity Accountability Act, which started pushing the city to measure and track and make progress on school integration. 
Yes, hi. Um, thank you so much for this wonderful program. It's really inspiring, and I can see that we're in good hands for the future with these kids in charge. Uh, my name is April Chapman. I'm the Brooklyn member for the panel for educational policy, and I've been in that position for about a year. Prior to that, I actually, well, I should say I grew up here in New York and Brooklyn. I went through the public school system and was in a very segregated elementary and middle school. And then when I went to high school, it was definitely more diverse and it opened up the world for me. So I look forward to uh, engaging you all in discussion. Um, my name is Xavier Zim, and I'm a senior in Democracy Prep High School. Okay. Hi, uh, my name is Lazar Treschan. I appreciate everyone who's taken a, a made an attempt at my last name until now. So uh, <laughs> thank you. Um, Amazing to be here, so inspired. Uh, uh, I do youth and education policy at the Community Service Society. Also grew up in New York City, went to public schools here. Um, and uh, really, again, excited to be here. Hi, I'm Coco Rum. I'm a junior at Beacon High School. Hello, everyone. I'm very happy to be here tonight. My name is Diogeny Artiles, and I'm a senior at Forest Hills High School. Thank you. All right, so now that we all know who's sitting up here, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start us off with a quick little question. Now, the first question that I have for every single person on this panel, and I'll start it off with myself once asking, is should there be high schools with screens? My answer is no. <laughs> My answer is fewer. Um, I would say that there should be some screened high schools, but not as many as there are now, and that more students should have access to better high schools. Um, I think, yeah, pretty much no, but I think screens can be effective if they work to actually help integrate schools. Um, and I think, again, also sometimes screens can be used in terms of like, if I really like to do art and I want to go to a school where I want to do art, that can be an effective use of screens. But I think the way screens are used now is not um, acceptable. Yeah, I agree with mostly everyone on this panel. Um, there should definitely be fewer screen schools and definitely more educational opportunity schools like Coco and Wyatt presented, more schools that admit lower achieving students with higher achieving students so that mix can create more educational opportunity. Thank you. All right, so my next question would be, do you think that specialized high schools should have this one exam that determines whether a student gets to succeed or whether a student has to go through an obstacle to get to college? My answer is no. <laughs> My answer is no, um, but I wanna come back and talk about the movement that would actually need to be built to change it. Um, because I think it's pretty clear if you watch, if you see, if you listen to that presentation, if you see the numbers, um, that's for at least, it's, it gets complicated, but at least for Stuy, Bronx Science, and Brooklyn Tech, making that change will require a change in state law, and the state legislature is not making change unless a big, powerful movement is built. The people in this room have the smarts and courage to be the leaders of that movement, um, but it's gonna take a lot of people in the streets and organizing and building a much more powerful movement if we want that change made. Yes, hi. Um, I would agree with Brad and that the specialized high schools that need state, you know, the state to make the change, that would really take a big movement, and I think people should push in that direction. There are other specialized high schools that changes could be made, 
without state approval. So I hope that uh, educational professionals and those who are making policy and people who can come out to speak to the panel for education policy meetings, which are monthly, there's time at each of those meetings for public comment. And I have to say, I was so amazed by the proposals that were made that in a certain sense, just if a bunch of you came and just signed up and read through them all, it would be on the record, live screened, you know, people could respond to it. I mean, that's, that's one sort of approach. But no, I do not think that there should be one test for these specialized high schools, especially because a lot of the material in the test is not even taught so in the regular curriculum. So if you're not prepped for it, and I was you know, so shocked to hear about the preparation that the one young woman who was in the DREAM program, that was just totally unacceptable to not be taught when you're in a special program. Oh, sorry. high school test is blind in the sense that um, it is blind to it the way it perpetuates um, racist like racist and classist structures um, so it is you know race blind or need blind but it requires a certain amount of preparation that is not <laughs> need blind or race blind because we often find that there's a huge intersection between the people who cannot afford the preparation for these exams and black and brown you know, students and families. What she said. Um, <laughs> the specialized high school admissions test is the tiki torch of the white supremacy system that is public education in New York City. Um, it sh that should be the easiest thing to take down. And yes, it is only 6 or 8% of students, but it is so symbolic. It is that tiki torch in the movement that we need to, we need to lop the head off of that and then and move down the line. Um, I'm, you know, yes, we need uh, a state legislation, but I'm tired of hearing um, local officials say that what we first need is the mayor to say that he's against it. Right? And nothing's going to happen at the state level until he says he's against it. Um, so that needs to happen. We need to do, uh, make the change in the other five specialized schools, show not only that the sky doesn't fall, but that those schools get a lot better once we diversify and integrate them and use them as models for, how, for this movement that we need to do to change the oldest three specialized high schools. Yeah, I feel like I can't add much to what, already, what has already been said. Um, yeah, plain and simple, no, there should not be one test. I agree as well. Um, I think there are so many different forms of intelligence and the fact that one morning a three hour test can shape your future adds so much, yeah, adds so much power to that test and there are so many ways someone can show their ability that's not just a test, maybe essays or artwork or performance, but not just one test. All right, so now I just wanna give a little background before I ask this next question. Now, I have the honor on, uh, of sitting on the School Diversity Advisory Group, and I have been able to see um, New York City's diversity plan. And for one of their actions, um, what I read was their definition of diversity was that a school that is diverse has a population of no more than 50% of black and Latino students in a school. Yet there are, oh, I'm sorry. Oh. But there are still so many schools that have over 90% percent of students that are black and Latino. So now my question, in a few brief words, would be, what is your definition of diversity? Because my definition of diversity is that there is an equal representation of all races, not more than 50 and definitely not 90%. So, I mean, I, the, what we, we have a very diverse city, just a segregated one. So, I mean, the benchmark is the percentage of, of students in each school should come as close as possible to matching the total percentage of students in the whole city. Um, that is a meaningful minority of African-American and Latino students. The system is about 70% African-American and Latino. Um, and schools absolutely can succeed with 70% African-American and Latino students. Look, they can succeed with 90% African-American and Latino students. But if we, what we want are schools that reflect the diversity of the city and a kind of guarantee 
that we're going to treat them all equally so that resources are allocated in a way that isn't biased based on whether they're whiter, then that's the right benchmark. Yes, um, in terms of diversity in the school, um, it should reflect the diversity of the students in the city. And most importantly, I think, for me, I feel that there's not sort of equity of resources in the school. So whether you're in a neighborhood that's poor or you live in a neighborhood where the parents can advocate more, or raise more money, that should not affect your educational outcome. That should not affect what your day-to-day -day in the school is. You should, all, the, the baseline of what's needed in every school should be higher. So if it's an area that has less resources and they need more, they should get more. That, that's my thoughts on it. Um, I agree, and I think that, again, diversity would look like schools um, ref reflecting the diversity of New York City, like uh, 60, two thirds of New York City um, people, at students are black and Latinx, so I think schools should have two thirds of their population black and Latinx as well. And to go back on the point of equality versus equity, um, equal resources doesn't mean equal opportunity because if there are people who have had money and resources prior to that, that will consistently outperform just raw intelligence and talent. So we have to make sure that the resources aren't equal, but they're like it's based on equity and not equality. Thank you. The city's benchmarks are garbage. Um, they, have, they have chosen a distribution that is, that is so close to what would happen automatically. The city's gentrifying, right? We see that in our neighborhoods. Well, the numbers that we've run would show that if you did nothing, no public policy, you'd hit the city benchmark in five years by the way the, the population shifts are happening on their own. How about this? Um, <laughs> In, if you just waited five years and did nothing, just because of gentrification, just because of the economic changes that are happening in the city already, you would reach the city's benchmark in its school uh, diversity plan. That is a fake plan. Um, what we need to be doing is real policies, and, and let's not even talk about what's happening inside of our schools. Um, my daughters go to the school down the block, PS9, which is being destroyed by a GNT program that segregates the classrooms the, the, in, inside the same grade. It would be a, that, uh, that school has a perfect distribution of students. Um, it's almost exactly the citywide distribution of students, but the classrooms don't look that way because specialized high schools, GNT, these other screens are dividing our students at every level, and that's what white supremacy does. It is insidious and infects all different levels. So we need to be very aggressive in fighting it, and we need to set benchmarks that are much stronger than the ones we have uh, in the supposed point. Um, yeah, definitely in agreement. Uh, I'd just like to add, though, that um, I think diversity definitely means um, that our school should be representative of the New York, of New York City's demographics, or I should say the New York City student body's demographics. Um, and I also think that diversity means diversity in terms of socioeconomic backgrounds, um, diversity in terms of neighborhood, and all sorts of these other things. Um, I think there's many many forces that go into making a diverse school, but um, definitely having schools where uh, there is, where the students are representative of the city, um, that's one of the main, main things, and yeah. Mm -hmm. Definitely, I agree with everyone on this panel once again. Um, <laughs> yeah, being the last one here. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> um, Along with racial diversity, another very important type of diversity, I think, is intellectual diversity, the backgrounds people bring into a classroom. And that is not possible when, as everyone said, when a classroom looks the same. A story a black person or a poor person can bring to a classroom is very different than that of a white person or an Asian person. And having this diversity in a classroom inherently improves intellectual diversity and changes the exchange of thought that we receive in a classroom. Yeah. Can Thank I add you. one more thing here? As I think this set of answers um, reflect something that's important for all of us to try to change in how people think when they hear integration. 
Because I think what people hear is kind of one of two things. First, you have this like, you know, 1960s idea of a couple of students of color integrating an all white school. So that's like a model of integration. It was all white, a few students of color are added, we call that integration. So that is not what anybody is looking for. I mean, those were some courageous white students, but you know they were, I mean, African American students, <laughs> excuse me. But you know, they were like subject to racial terror. Uh, that is not what we're trying to do, is like set people up to be terrorized. Uh, so a second thing I think people hear is we're gonna gentrify schools. So like a form of integration is the schools of Sunset Park will be integrated because Sunset Park will be gentrified. So that is also not what we mean. I think what we said here is the form of integration we want is that the schools reflect the diversity of the city and that would be true for all the schools, school A and school B as we saw it uh, up on the board before. Um, but it's a lot of work to do to help shift people. That we had in our um, in this, this very meeting, right? So what I would like to hear, um, or what we would like to hear, is just a few words or some insight about what you think about the proposals that were made by Teens Take Charge and by the students of New York City. So I, very, I agree again with the proposals. Um, um, <laughs> one of the, um, when I think of the best proposals that were proposed was uh, educational opportunity proposals, so having um, um, a diverse amount of students performing, so the lower 25%, the middle 50%, and the top 25% um, of students going into public schools. Um, I go to Forest Hills High School, and the law program there that I go to is Education Opportunity at Op. So there's um, uh, a mix of intellectual ability, and I think that encourages lower achieving students to get to the mid-range and mid-range students to try to mimic the um, top 25%. So having that mix re really encourages us as a community to match each other and succeed together. Well, I presented the proposal, so I think you you already know that I support them. Um, but yeah, I definitely think um, that academic integration can be a really powerful tool to help achieve racial and socioeconomic um, integration because what we see time and time again is that these forces are, or these forms of segregation are so intertwined and interconnected that they all kind of have to, when we're integrating our public schools and when we're thinking about how to do that, we have to be intentional about making sure that racial integration and socioeconomic integration and academic integration are all happening at the same time and they help to fuel each other. Um, huge supporter of all the proposals. Uh, I, I, you know, I was just really struck um, with some of the, the comments from in, in, the, in the testimony, you know, we need to use the system, like right now, our public education system is a reflection of what's messed up about the rest of society, right? And, you know, but you, it, it really should be the opposite, right? Education should be turning that on its head. So what we need to be doing, like those proposals, is how do, you know, how do we use our education? You know, people say education is the key, right? Education is the lock right now. We need to make it. We need to make it the key, and we need to, um, you know, use our, our the demand uh, uh, and, and our, our sort of market demand and create policies that put people in schools um, that make make, it, make them look like the society we want to live in, and unfortunately, not the one we live in right now. And I think your proposal would do that. I agree. <laughs> Uh, I wanted to thank you for making those proposals. I thought a lot of uh, hard work went into them and they're very compelling. Your first proposal about increasing academic diversity, um, I think that would make a huge difference. Uh, there are schools now that, uh, I think it's called Educational Opportunity Ed Op, where they take the different percentages as you mentioned. And that makes a huge difference because just like testing for gifted and talented so early, people mature and come into their being at different times in their life and someone may blossom in high school, and you need to be around students who offer various different things, and you offer yours, and then you can grow from that. You have a chance to actually go to a good school. All the schools should be good schools. Um, the other proposal, um, especially the one about the specialized high school exam, I do agree that something has to be changed about that. That's, uh, I don't think that it's fair to uh, determine who's going to get to go to those type of schools just by people who can you know, have access to what they need to study for because it's not in the regular curriculum. It would be, I think, a very interesting proposal to look at that top 3%. Uh, 
I'd like to look into that further because it sounds like a good idea to me. Um, I also support all the proposals. Now it's like we know what it's like to be on the other side. Um, I want to even underline a couple of things that I think are extra smart about them. For you know, I think it's not surprising that that this set of folks did the work, but I think it's worth making sure everybody knows. Part of the challenge in developing a school integration plan is that a result as a result of a misguided Supreme Court decision, you're not allowed to use race to as part of a strategy to achieve an integrated school. So that's a backward Supreme Court decision that uh, that that's anyway, that sort of took the idea that you're not allowed to segregate and basically said in some ways you can't specifically use the individual race of a student to integrate. We can go into the details of the sorry, it's not true. Uh, it can be a factor within a factor within a factor, they said. So it can be, and just recently the University of Texas plan was part of it, which uses race, was allowed by the Supreme Court. Yeah. You know, it was remanded, it was not, it was not ruled against. What, what I would say here is like, what these strategies do is achieve integration in a way that the Supreme Court has said is permissible to do. So whether we think that decision is rightly decided or wrongly decided and exactly what it says, using both the academic diversity and the top 3% strategy get us integration uh, with the rules, with the society and with the rules that we have now and I think it's a very smart way of doing so. Uh, one thing I would just add to it is if you think that it does not, ma if it makes sense to have achievement diversity in high schools, it sure doesn't make sense to have gifted and talented programs in elementary schools. So like having achievement sorting of four and five year olds like, it's, there's no reason for that at all. Like, you just, you can't even really make a case for it. So, um, I would just argue that if you follow the logic of these proposals, that's just a, a set of programs that we should abolish. Yes. Um, now, one more thing on this same topic. Um, now, it wasn't a part of one of the proposals, but it is something that really hit home to me. And it was about the renewal schools um, process that we've been going through. Now. A part of the renewal schools program, um, what happens is resources are allocated to schools, they become community schools, longer school days, more resources, guidance counselors that should have been in their first place. That's what's being added once the school fails. Now, this should just be a given that if you put them there in the first place, the school wouldn't fail, right? So then, John Bounds um, in Queens, we have those resources, and I am a student that goes to that school, and I can tell you for sure that becoming a community school and having extra guidance counselors really makes that difference. So it's not a part of the proposals, but it is something that New York City can do for most of their schools. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to um, open up the discussion, and we're going to move to solutions that come not only from panel members, but also the audience here. So where do we go now? What happens to the New York City school system? So please just raise your hand, and we're going to come around with the mic. Thank you. Okay. Hello, everyone. I actually have a very important question. Uh, question. Um, oftentimes, I feel like um, in our students of color, there is like a trauma that many people don't know how to speak of because we haven't been like properly educated on how to express it ourselves. But if, you know, from such young ages, you know, we are taught that our communities are not, you know, of a certain value or that our schools are not on the same level of, you know, our richer or whiter counterparts, how can we learn, you know, to accept ourselves for what it is? And um, oftentimes when looking at failing schools, we see students with extreme, you know, behavioral issues or failing teachers and low and misused funding and often a lack of mental awareness due to the stigma and the miseducation of it. So what do you guys think can be done to combat the lack of mental health awareness in our public school system, which plays such a large role in the And you know, I'm gonna say something about that. Any more solutions? Do we have anyone that has a solution? We're gonna come to this side. Well, I mean, I'll respond about the mental health uh, question that you had. I think that it's really important that schools, especially like now with the community schools, you can see that it makes a big difference when there's enough guidance counselors and 
So those sort of resources need to be made available in the schools to all of our children because once you're having the proper counseling, there can be, they can actually deal with the issues and they need to be training for the teachers. There are some schools that are set up this way. And then the kids who really have mental health problems that need to be dealt with further, they can help to identify that and get them and their families to those resources. It's really important to not ignore it. So the fact that you highlighted it as an issue, it's an issue that takes place not just in schools, but in the workplace and other places. Um, um, yeah, also I think, just to address your first question, um, the idea of culturally responsive education is something that's hugely important when we're talking about integration. Um, seeing yourself reflected in what you're learning in your curriculum, curriculum is, um, is vital and it's definitely something that has not been going on. You know that that um, that our current kind of school that the, the current education that students are receiving is not culturally responsive. But I think definitely when we're speaking about integration, we have to think about more than just kind of um, like just representation, but also what's happening within the school, what's happening within the classroom, what is the kind of the curriculum like, what are the relationships with students like, um, teachers, whatnot. So that's a really important question. And then also to touch on your second question. Um, yeah, I definitely think there needs to be a lot more mental health resources available in schools, um, especially in <coughs> schools where there's high concentrations of students who have experienced trauma. And um, also just to general, like destigmatization of <laughs> mental health issues. Um, so yeah. I would just I would add that you know what happened on this stage prior to this panel, not this panel would be great, but um, you know is good evidence that under the right circumstances, education can be used as a vehicle for people to learn to write and speak and think together with other people in a way that is part of healing things that are broken, um, and like that's part of what social and emotional learning in schools can be, is like what happened on the stage here, in which people kind of come to discover themselves in relationship to others, learn to build on those schools and uh, those skills, and more and more of the kinds of jobs we need people to have are folks who develop and build those skills. So that's part of what can be in, I mean, when we say culturally responsive education, some of that is making sure everybody's histories and cultures are taught and that the teaching staff represents it, but some of what I think we mean is that the skills we're building together are the kinds of relationship building and the kind of trying to heal broken things together that are a lot more of what we need people to be able to do in the work world. Yeah, I completely second what everyone said. <laughs> Um, I can testify personally, um, I'm taking AP Art History now, and a few years ago the AP Art History exam was rewired to include a lot more Latin American and African and Native American art, except my teacher refuses to teach that, to teach that in class. He only teaches European art, so you know Impressionism, Mannerism, and then at home we have to study the African art or the South American art on our own. He makes us go on Khan Academy and we have to learn it ourselves, and as the AP exam comes up, we simply don't know half of the material because he only knows the European art. And that is inexcusable. The AP art history exam has been perhaps three years ago rewired and he still doesn't know this material to teach us. So teachers need to be aware of cultural representation. Um, yeah. And I think and I'm not sure of the exact statistic, but when a black student doesn't have a black teacher for elementary school or middle school, they're disproportionately more likely to end up in jail, and that is completely crazy. We need to have representation in the classroom so uh, students can... Yeah. Thank you. Students must see themselves in their teachers. Thank you. All right, so now we're going to go to a student for um, another suggestion or solution. Here you go.
amazing, so thank you. Yeah. You, know, you, know, you know, Brad really talked about, you know, schools should look like what this is, right? Why, is it, why isn't this happening in school? And even more, like, why aren't you getting the skills um, that you need to be successful later on? So, you know, you can think about, so why does it happen? You know, maybe it's benign neglect, maybe it is white supremacy. Regardless, like, we need more. So another proposal that we have is that every high school student every year between uh, in the summer should have a paid internship, right? Um, so how much do you learn outside the classroom? How much would you learn by earning a wage, interacting with people um, in the ways that, that Brad's talking about, um, and, and all those things? You know, why isn't that happening? Why isn't high school an optional 12-month program where if you just want to go for 10 months, that's fine, but otherwise you can do two more months or six to eight weeks of a paid internship, which is based on something you're doing in school, um, it wouldn't cost that, that much more compared to what we're already paying each year. And think about, you'd come back to school energized, you'd have stuff to work on in class, you'd have a whole set of relationships and things like that, you'd have money in your pocket, you'd be able to support your family and save for college. You know, internships are the best college prep in the world because it makes you realize, well, this is why I want to go to college, because I know what I'd want to study. I know how much money I'd need to save for different things. So uh, uh, I could not agree with you more. Hello everyone, my name is Faraj Anna Jones. First off, I want to give kudos to all our teenagers, our young people, uh, for hearing the call of their ancestors and the ones before them. You've always had that power. You're not being empowered. That power has been within you. You have the vibranium in you. Uh, and thank you for that. Uh, I'm a parent at a Title I school. Uh, those who have made, read my uh, wife's article, Choosing School for Our Daughter, uh, where us as parents, we have chose uh, to use our resources, to use our power to, in, uh, to be in a, a school where it's 90% black and Latino, and there's no disparity in that. Um, the other part is the uh, parent making the choice. Um, and I'm speaking to my white parents who believe in integration and believe in diversity. Uh, there's no disparity in your child being the only white one in the classroom. Uh, there, is, there is nothing courageous about that. What's courageous is Ruby Bridges going in there and facing the white mother who had a uh, baby in a coffin. Uh, I'm letting you know that uh, you, your child benefits by being in a classroom with black kids. Your child benefits by not having to take the GNT test and being in classes with kids that have IEPs. Um, your child benefits, um, and I believe my child will benefit. My child is, is excelling uh, because of, of the space that she's in. Um, I'm really nervous because uh, I got a lot to say. Uh, the other part is, my, if my wife was here, she'll tell, she'll tell you that um, to uh, blow, up, blow it all up is what she'll say. Um, and we have uh, smart, brilliant, my young minds who have already given us the blueprint because they followed the instructions of the predecessors. And so they have more courage than the adults who are in elective office, and we need to put them at the forefront. They have given us the uh, instructions, they have taken the lead on this, and we need to follow them. We don't need to do any more lip service and talking and, 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 and thinking about, well, maybe you know, we won't get there. We have to create the legacy and the legacy now. It's no, it, it really is no, uh, no wonder that the New York State has not been sued uh, and brought to the Supreme Court for not ever integrating their school system. And you're pointing the finger at Charlottesville, you're pointing the finger at the South uh, for them pulling down their statues and their monuments of uh, of, of segregation and, and white supremacy. We need to pull down the monument of white supremacy and segregation in our education system. We need to start with that. The other part is, and here's the solution for you, and these are to the elected officials. You need to, I don't know if you need to put a banner on, the, on, on, on City Hall, but it needs to read. New York City is the most segregated city district in the country. New York City also has the third most segregated schools in the country. Your policies need to be in line with that fact. 
Not running away from it. You need to stand and look at it to know what your job is as political officials. And the rest will fall in line. Be courageous as these young people. Be courageous as these parents who are being looked upon with uh, school officials as pariahs for stepping in and being and affirming for our children. You need to be courageous. Don't be passive aggressive about it. Be aggressive about it. Like P. Diddy says, don't talk about it, be about it. plan that we plan on taking to solidify this change and not just talk about it, but like we said, to be about it. Okay? So, How many people here are from District 15? Any District 15 parents and students? All right. Not that many, but uh, so in District 15 right now, we're in the middle of a planning process to try to get much more integrated middle schools. There's going to be four public meetings. We had two so far. That means there's still two to come. And the kinds of plans we are able to put on the table are exactly like the ones that Teens Take Charge put before us earlier. So come to those last two meetings, help us take some of these exact proposals and make them the admissions policy for the middle schools of District 15. And I'll just add that in addition to admissions formula, we are trying to think about making sure that what happens in those integrated schools, once the new admissions formula is in place, reflects the kind of culturally competent and supportive and more reflective education. So, but we need more voices. The first two meetings have been good, but not good enough. So uh, my one action step would be, um, if you're even close to District 15, 
um, come out to those last two meetings and help us bring home a new plan that we can implement next fall in District 15 middle schools. I'm totally um, blown away by the power and the words of the teams today and feel that we're in really good hands with these plans that you've put forth. I would say just activate more young people, you know, spread the word and get them involved in what you're doing. Um, Brad mentioned what's happening in District 15, but they're also having diversity town halls in each of the five boroughs. They just had one in Brooklyn, I guess it was this week, and they have others coming up, and you don't, you can go to one or another borough, so I would say, and there's also like an email that you can send ideas into. I would just suggest that everyone use whatever channels that they have, reach out to your elected officials, Know, let them know that there's a lot of power coming from people who want changes in the system. And you just have to, everyone has to reach out in whatever ways that they know. Elected officials come to the educational policy meetings, go to these diversity workshops. And, you know, just the power of the young people is awesome. I know you guys are going to make this change. Thank you so much. And I love you. Thank you so much for letting me be here and get inspired by you guys. The only thing I think um, should happen now is I hope the young people here just don't take no for an answer. Um, just, just keep going over, you know, Nelson, one, one line he talked about was, he said that students that need saving, it's the adults that need saving, and you need to save us. So you're our only hope. Um, you know, so please don't take no for an answer and keep fighting. Um, I have a really simple suggestion for you all, which is to talk. Um, talk to people in your community, in your school, if you're a parent or a student. Talk about what we're doing and talk about what's happening because what we need is people to know about this, to care about it, and to get excited about it. And from there comes more and more action. Um, so I know that sometimes engaging with these issues is complicated and it's difficult, but that's a really simple thing that everyone can do, um, and so I hope you all do it. Yeah, definitely. Um, <laughs> I never know how to start my, my responses. <laughs> um, so become knowledgeable and share that knowledge, as Coco said. So read more, read articles. Um, know your history and then share that history so people can become aware and inspire your community to come to events like this and just spark change. And thank you everyone. I think that, well I'm speaking to, like I noticed that a lot of the people in this room are white and so I'm speaking to like the white parents and the white adults. Um, don't walk out of this room and forget everything that has happened. Um, we participated in the walkout as well, and I marched with uh, the, the protesters um, on March 20, 24th, um, on Saturday, and what we don't talk about is how, like we marched, but we weren't marching for the students, the black and brown students who lose their lives every day to gun violence. of the New York City Department of Education. We are the 1.2 million bodies that represent New York City. So if there's anyone that can make a change, it's us. So for every student in here and for every parent in here, encourage your child, encourage your fellow peers, encourage your classmates. 
because I know everyone has tons of friends on Snapchat, Instagram, and Facebook. Get the word out. Encourage your friends not to sit and twiddle their thumb, but to stand up and use their voice. Thank you. Now, what we would like to do is thank you, thank every single person in here for coming out on this Thursday before our 10-day break for spring break. Thank you guys for being here very long. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, so this is, we're going to conclude the show, but we definitely want to thank the Public Library Center for, you know, and letting us use their space. It's a beautiful space, so thank you for that. Um, thank you to our Go volunteers, to everybody for coming out. Um, honestly, like, there is change, and I can feel it in this room. And what a lot of people don't know is that New York City has, has had the biggest civil rights um, display with students left in the whole entire history of the United States of America. And I have faith that that will happen again. Um, yeah, but definitely um, help us out. There's a link that um, to help donate to Teen State Charge so that we can have more events like this and we can do um, more things like this. Yeah, so thank you.